Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage 1998 SME President Ihor Kunash. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Buenos dias, damas y caballeros. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. Dobroho dnia, pani i panowie. My name is Ihor Kunash, as you have heard. I was the 1998 president, it seems such a long time ago. And one of the honor I had and privilege is that standing in front of you is a Legion of Honor member of 53 years, member of Society of Mining Engineers. So I wish you a lot of perseverance and patience, and in 50 years, you might have the opportunity to stand here where I am. <clears throat> As past president, I was also one of the two expat SME presidents. I worked in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and I was president of Newmont Uzbekistan Limited. Finally, you notice I'm wearing the tradition in, traditional Ukrainian embroidered shirt. I am of Ukrainian heritage. Mesdames, thank you. <clears throat> Mesdames et Messieurs, nous vous souhaitons un accueil chaleureux à nos voisins proches et lointains à cette réunion annuelle de la Société minière, métallurgique et d'exploration. Elle réunit les plus grandes organisations et les plus brillants représentants de l'industrie minière du monde. Notre société est devenue la plus importante source mondiale d'information minière et technologique. Nous vous invitons à découvrir ces possibilités. Profitez-en. Nous sommes convaincus que cette conférence vous donnera la chance de découvrir de nouvelles techniques minières, métallurgiques, d'apprendre de nouvelles cibles d'exploration et renouer les contacts avec vos anciens amis professionnels et d'en faire des nouveaux. Nous savons que vous apprécieriez cette réunion et nous vous souhaitons beaucoup de succès. I know it's here somewhere. Damas y caballeros, les deseamos un gran ben bienvenida a nuestros vecinos tan cercanos y lejanos a la reunión nacional de nuestra famosa Sociedad de Minería, Metalurgía y Exploración que reúne a las mayores organizaciones del mundo y las mentes más brillantes que representan a la industria de la minería en todo el mundo. La sociedad cuenta con las más completas fuentes de información sobre la tecnología minera en el mundo. Aprovechenla. Estamos seguros de que esta reunión les ofrecerá la oportunidad de conocer nuevas tecnologías aprender algo de varios proyectos de exploración y tener la oportunidad de encontrar sus antiguos amigos, seguramente nuevos. De todo modo, sabemos que disfrutarán mucho de esta reunión. Shanoni Druji, Shcheri Previt Narichnomuzisti Vse Amerikansko Hotovarestva Hirnetstva, Metalurgi y Georozvitki. Protiahom bahato roki u tovarestvo stalo najbiljšem u sviti džerelom tehničnoj informaciji jer neće hrobit, zaprošujemo vas ve koristate ci možljivosti. Me znajemo, što se čorična narada da zvam možljivist, poznakomete se z novemi tehnologijami, zjednati se z vašimi davnemi i novemi družjami, jak je rižno zapiznati novek. Bažajemo vam velikih uspisiv. I do this also. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual mine exchange meeting of the internationally renowned Société for Mining Metallurgy Exploration, which brings together the largest organizations and the brightest mines representing the mining industry around the world. As the 2022 SME president, Ron Parazzo, amply said, SME gives you the opportunity to expand your professional network, make new, lasting impressions, and engaging networking functions. CMA 
the 125th National Western Mining Conference and SME are the only meetings dedicated to all the disciplines of mining engineering. SME has become the world's largest source of technical mining information. Take advantage of this opportunity. We know that you will enjoy this meeting and wish you a great success. Willkommen zu dieser Konferenzen. Benvenuti a tutti i nostri amici professionali di Italia. Benvindo a SME. Yoko So, SME. Juan Jung, SME. Svatgut He, Vitame. Thank you very much. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the 2022 President, Ron Parat. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Eeyore is a hard act to follow. I will uh, assure you that my entire comments will be in English. As Eeyore mentioned, I am Ron Parrott. I have the uh, honor to be the 2022 SME president. I have over 40 years of exploration experience for precious metals, uh, including time with companies such as Santa Fe Pacific Gold, Homestake Mining Company, AUEX Ventures, and Renaissance Gold. For our safety share this morning, I'd like to uh, note the emergency procedures here at the Colorado Convention Center. In the case of a medical, a fire, or a security emergency, find a house phone and dial 200. Do not call 911. The Colorado Convention Center Security Department has preset protocols with the local emergency communication center for the best entrance for responders. We certainly got planned this year another great conference. We have now something in excess of 6,100 people in attendance. Our technical program will include 115 sessions. We have 80 sponsors for this conference and importantly more than 585 technical exhibiting companies. Before we get started this morning, uh, please be certain to turn off your cell phones uh, to respect the uh, presenters. Our session today is entitled Embracing ESG to Build Trust in Mining Investments, and that'll be a panel discussion. Kim? A few, excuse me, I just had a couple more, I'm sorry. Following the panel discussion, we'll enjoy a lecture from Phillips Baker, Jr., CEO, Hecla Mining Company, and Chris Neville, Operations Manager, the Lucky Friday Mine, as winners of the Robert Murray Innovation Award. They'll speak to us today about Hecla's commitment to innovation and how it transformed mining at the United States' deepest mine. And now sit back and enjoy a video introducing our topic today, as well as the moderators and the panelists. Thank you.
Good morning. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming to this panel this morning. We're here today to discuss ESG, environmental, social governance, and the issues it encompasses for mining. We have a series of prepared questions that we'll be asking our panelists. Then, assuming that we have additional time remaining, we'll be asking the audience for questions. You'll see a couple of white pieces of paper around. So when we ask for questions from the audience, please feel free to fill out on the piece of paper and um, send that to the center aisle. Okay, so to kick off our panel discussion today, we'd like to start with a question for all of the panel members. Contrary to published data and statements indicating ESG factors continue to accelerate among investors, insurance carriers, private equity, and other lenders, there has recently been a rise in anti-ESG investing rhetoric and the politicization of ESG investing. In your opinion, what might be driving this anti-ESG sentiment, and has this affected how you think about ESG and related priorities? We'll start this um, by asking that of the insurance community, represented today by Ryan. Thank you. Not Mr. Bond. That joke always has to come out. So good morning, everybody, and, and, and again, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk here. Um, the, the challenge around integrating ESG and sustainability into operations is probably part of, of that rhetoric and that challenge around whether or not it's achieving the right objectives. Um, and the reality is where we sit from is we think first and foremost about how this may impact our clients. So where we're currently standing is, is that this is definitely something that is being considered in all parts of industry. Um, and we're endeavoring to ensure that insurance does it in the same speed and at the same pace. Um, for myself, I sit within a global team that thinks about climate and sustainability. So I can tell you from our perspective, we are continuing to invest, we're continuing to train, we're continuing to think about the value propositions that we can offer to our customers, because we see this even though there are a stalling and an, an approach to understand how to move forward on this and again some political backwards and forwards and discussion which I think is a positive thing because this is a big change it has to be debated at the highest levels but the reality is it will come at some point now from a, again clearly from an insurance perspective we have to think that most of this challenge is currently in the US around the political backdrop and the insurance industry and reinsurance, in, reinsurance industries are both exceptionally global, especially in the mining and metal space. If you think about how placements are put into the insurance market, that will generally go into other external marketplaces, Bermuda, Europe, continental Europe, into Lloyd's. Those areas aren't seeing the same battle around the political backwards and forwards. So we have to be ready at some point for when this becomes a greater topic. The one thing that I get concerned about in, in reality is, although the debate is excellent and should happen, that this is delaying the progress of applying it. And with certain commitments being made, the longer that we move on from actually achieving some of these things, there may be a rush, and then there's an unintended consequence from that rush about the delivery and the consistency of that approach. That's probably enough for me to hand off to somebody else. Thank you so much for that, Ryan. Um, excellent points. Aidan, how about the perspectives of ICMM? Yeah, thanks, um, thanks, Kelly. I guess, I guess if you take a little bit of a step back, and when we think about you know, ESG, you know, fundamentally it is, is simply a framework that measures investment risk. So it's the risk that you know, failure to successfully manage those aspects might result in a, in a hit for enterprise value. So, Looked at simplistically, you know, anti-ESG rhetoric seems a little bit like being, you know, anti-motherhood and apple pie. You know, which one of us would not want our pension fund managers to be cognizant of environmental, social, or governance risks? But I think the the anti-ESG sentiment of today, one of the things that kind of intrigues me about it is, it's got echoes in the anti-social responsibility rhetoric from about 50 years ago. Uh, and in particular, if any of you is familiar with the work of Milton Friedman, your know, Friedman was uh, vehemently opposed to the notion that businesses might have any social responsibility beyond uh, you know, paying returns to shareholders. In fact, he called social responsibility a fundamentally subversive doctrine. 
So the thing that puzzles me is 50 years on from Friedman, when I think we'd laid those kind of uh, you know, perspectives to rest, why are we seeing a rise in anti-ESG sentiment today? And I think there's two things driving this. There's a, there's a political or an ideological dimension, and, and Ryan's touched on that. And then there's a practical dimension. You know, so politically, I think we, we are seeing, particularly in the US, you know, a number of politicians take strongly anti-ESG positions. And that's, that's driven, I think, from a number of different perspectives. Some, I think, you know, are questioning the extent to which ESG is simply virtue signaling, the extent to which it has any bearing on enterprise value. And so they're challenging the notion that this is something that really ought to be taken into consideration in the investment decision-making process. I think others have concerns that it might somehow be a smokescreen. Uh, you know, essentially, you know, companies pretending they're doing something, but actually, you know, this is really about trying to see off regulation. And the case of BlackRock, I think, brilliantly illustrates the kind of opposite ends of the spectrum. You know, we've seen BlackRock being on the receiving end of a letter from 19 U.S. state attorneys, attorneys general, where they challenged BlackRock on their position with respect to fossil fuel funding, saying, you know, this, this is unacceptable. Meanwhile, the U.S. Uh, city controller is writing to BlackRock saying, it's unacceptable, you're just not going fast enough on these issues. So, those are kind of the polar opposites of, of, of a debate that I think has to take place and will take place. But ultimately, I guess from a, from a practical standpoint, there's also issues around ESG. And nowhere are those issues more prevalent than I think when it comes to the ESG rating agencies. And so the rating agencies, I guess, are in the business of providing you know, ESG ratings, either to enable portfolio managers to construct you know, active or passively managed funds or to enable ESG to be integrated into the investment decision-making process. The problem is that when you look at the, the spread of ESG ratings that are coming out of different rating agencies, they're pretty widely dispersed. And so there's been some great academic work. It's done pairwise correlations between the ESG ratings out of different agencies. And at best, you're seeing something like about 0.5. So a, a, a weak to moderate correlation. You compare that for traditional credit rating agencies, and there we see correlations between different ratings of, of approaching one, so, so a perfect relationship. That's really problematic, uh, I think, for any of us who care about ESG being taken seriously. But, but finally, I mean, does that, does that matter personally to me in terms of you know, my, my view of ESG? Well, well, it doesn't, not in this sector. Because I don't think there's anybody that doesn't recognize the really strong linkage between sound environmental, social, and governance performance as a mining company and how that links to the financial health of a company, either in terms of your ability to attract investment or deliver shareholder returns. Excellent. Thank you so much for that, Aiden. And Casey, how about over at Core Mining? I think it stems, and, and building on the comments, um, I think it stems from a concern and maybe a misunderstanding that from the company side that we're looking outward to try to satisfy some external agenda and, and being guided by that primarily. Um, as was just stated in the mining industry, we've all had to manage environmental, social uh, risks on a foundation of good governance for a long time. And it's only recently that um, this uh, sort of debate and under the moniker of ESG has, has made this a political football. Uh, we start with an internal assessment, we've now updated it a couple of times, uh, a materiality assessment to uh, make sure that we're focused on the factors that have the most material impact on our business. For the first time last year, we expanded our materiality assessment to include investors and community leaders, and, and that really, drives our ESG agenda, uh, the output of that materiality assessment, because it, 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 it reveals for us what our most material issues are. On the investor side, I mean, I, I think there are, there's a long list of good internal reasons tied to long-term value and risk management to have the priorities that we have. But even if you're skeptical about all of those things, the, the sort of last uh, place I go is that these are the priorities of the people who own our company. And so, um, you know, as a public company with, with 
widely dispersed ownership, it can be easy to lose sight of the fact that these are the actual owners of the company. And if you sort of shift your lens and pretend that there's an individual, you know, who, who comes to visit us four times a year who owns the company and tells us, you know, in addition to, uh, uh, you know, increasing cash flow, reducing costs, the financial metrics and operational metrics, here, here are the two or three things that I care about and I want you to do. You can have your own opinion about that if you like, but <laughs> it is the owner of the company, you know, telling you that these are the priorities. So that's, um, again, that's a fallback. That's, that's not where we start, but um, it, it is instructive that in our outreach program, we don't hear any, any slowdown or any um, watering down of the focus on ESG factors. What we consistently hear are uh, en encouragement for the steps we've taken so far and an expectation that the next time they talk to us, we will have done even more. Thank you very much for that, gentlemen. Excellent responses to that general question. Now we're going to dive in a little bit to some of the more specific elements of ESG. And we're going to start with the S in ESG, social, which some may argue is in fact the most important one. So starting with Ryan, what social elements are insurers looking for at mining sites and the companies that they insure? Yeah, great. Thank you for that question. Um, just to set the scene, insurance is coming to ESG at a later date than a lot of the financial institutions and other industries. So the reality is the vocabulary and the fluency of, of the individuals that are having the conversations is not where it should be. So I think the reality is when I'm going to answer this question, what I'm going to try to do is pick a middle ground. Right? There's a typical response, but I think it's also frustrating but also the reality that at either end of the spectrum, you could get a complete opposite, right? So we've talked about how ESG is considered. You could actually have a situation where an underwriter doesn't care or even understand that part of the equation. So all of the good work that Casey and others are doing isn't brought into consideration. You may have at the other end of the spectrum, somebody who, again, understands it, but completely discounts it. But I think it's really important and, and you know, occasions like this to set the terminology is absolutely key to, to flushing some of that out. So we've talked about ESG, but sustainability is the overarching objective and ESG is that framework for achieving it. And I think that's absolutely important. But things like net zero and climate change are all going to get intermixed and conflated in this conversation. But when you come to your question, what do they actually care about? Everybody's got a different perspective mostly you would suggest that they're thinking about the risk element. They're thinking about where's the lack of evidence or, or um, procedures that are pointing towards a, a community engagement. So if there is an incident that's happened, is that customer going to be distracted by managing a con you know, the, the local community issues as well as fixing the problem and that will inflate a potential loss? But in essence, this is where it comes down to. Is diversity, equity, and inclusion a proven correlated position to driving better risk? That's not something that's completely understood or explored yet, but it's something we're trying to find out at Marsh and have done some wider studies to prove that too. So I think, to the point, I think they're looking for the risk element rather than the broader positive elements of we're social, which I do think will eventually come to the fore. Thank you very much for that, Ryan. And I think the word risk is going to come up over and over and over again throughout this panel discussion. So Casey, can you talk a bit about what Core Mining is doing with respect to stakeholder engagement and management and provide maybe some specific examples of where this was done well or maybe where it should have been done better? Sure. And, and you know, I remind myself that stakeholders is a, is a big tent. and. Uh, it's easy to think first about local communities, um, indigenous groups. Stakeholders are also employees. Um, so we, we address this uh, comprehensively. On the community side, probably like a lot of companies that are represented here, we have very proactive uh, engagement strategies uh, that are in some ways uh, common across all of our sites, but in, in important ways unique to each site. Uh, 
so for example, we have a large exploration project in northern BC that is on traditional First, Ter First Nations territory. We have formal impact benefit agreements with the affected First Nations um, there. Similarly, in Alaska, we have a, a formal arrangement with the Burners Bay Consortium, which is a, a consortium of three Alaska Native corporations, provides um, contracting for essential services, uh, community input. Uh, there's a, a formal community panel that meets once a year where we receive input, share what our plans are. In Mexico at Palmarejo, uh, we have formal agreements with all five ajitos who are impacted by our operations and similar to Alaska and British Columbia, it, those agreements are comprehensive and cover both economic benefits as well as um, employment uh, opportunities and, and apprenticeships and, and other forms of community support. So again, I, I suspect that these are the kinds of, of uh, initiatives and the kind of strategy that a lot of companies represented here follow. I do think uh, on the social side and in terms of stakeholders, as I mentioned, we, we consider employees as well. And just the point about uh, DE&I, and I can see how you know, there might be a lack of, of data that correlates DE&I to, to lower risk. We focus on the pretty significant risk these days, given the, the labor market, of, of ensuring that we have uh, a, a, a supply of, of talented people to, uh, to, to do the jobs that we need to be done. And encouraging uh, inclusion and, and promoting diversity and equity in, in our hiring practices only widens the pool of, of talent that we can attract. And at the very top, we think that it's important to have a leadership team that reflects uh, the, the workforce that we're trying to recruit. And so, you know, that drives priorities like board diversity um, as well. Thank you very much for that, Casey. Aiden, ICMM sets out social performance expectations for its members. What does this entail, and what are the commitments companies are making in that regard? So uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about the, 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 so, the social performance commitments of, of the membership and the fact that they are nested in a much broader set of commitments around environmental, social, and governance. But I just wanted to react to a, a couple of things my fellow panelists said, because it, it, it connects into the way we think about it as well. Um, I, you know, I think Ryan is absolutely right to say that whether it's the investment community or the insurance community, typically they are looking at this through the lens of risk. And I think what Casey alluded to is they're looking at this as much through the lens of opportunity and benefit as through a risk lens. And that's really informed the, the approach that we take within, within ICMM. Um, I think the other thing to say is that the S, probably in mining, it, it could well be the most important. And that's not to, to, to denigrate either the E or the G. But what's re really interesting, I think, is that particularly within the investment community, they started out probably with concerns over the governance aspects and, and fairly narrowly limited to governance, uh, you know, corporate governance aspects. They then became concerned and exercised by environmental issues, although sometimes climate seems to be the catch-all which encompasses the totality of the interest. And then more recently, they've come on to social. From, from ICMM's perspective, we nest that within uh, our mining principles. And our mining principles define good practice, environmental and social and governance commitments that our members make as a condition of members. So essentially, that becomes part of the, the, the promise of membership for ICMM companies. Um, those principles uh, are at a high level. There are 10 of them. They cover the spectrum of issues through from ethical business practices through to environmental issues, social governance. But when we start to drill down into the detail that lies beneath those 10 principles, we've got 38 clear and specific performance expectations. And that's where it lays out in fairly granular detail, this is the expectation of what, it, what good looks like. So on, on the social side, three of those 10 principles primarily relate to social issues, although the, there are a number of the others that also connect in. So there's a, a principle around respect for human rights, there's a principle around you know, social and community uh, performance, and there's a principle around stakeholder engagement. When we dig down into the detail in terms of the performance expectations, they cover 
a broad spectrum of issues. So one of the most recent that, that I think we built out pretty well is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you know, accepting that there is, an, there is an unproven link, the reality is that within our sector, you know, typically companies may average between 13 to 17% of employment of women, which tells you there is a vast untapped potential in terms of our ability to access talent as an industry. So beyond DEI, the specific commitments cover things like support for the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, issues around security and human rights, issues around involuntary resettlement and how you deal with that in situations where you may need to relocate people. Uh, it covers uh, labor-related matters, such as the elimination of, of harassment and discrimination. It covers gender-related aspects and in particular, trying to adopt gender-informed approaches both to work practices and job design. And then it encompasses on the opportunity sides things like community development, business opportunities through procurement, and, and, and obviously really uh, hard-edged approaches to stakeholder engagement. So there's a lot in there, but it's a really important set of issues. Thank you very much for Hayden. Thank you very much for that, Aiden. You're right, there's a lot in there, a lot to unpack. Absolutely. Um, and just to kind of piggyback off the E part a little bit, switching over to climate change, which we know is a hot topic these days, sometimes quite literally, uh, many companies are setting climate targets. So gentlemen, seeking your feedback on what kind of targets are being set, are they achievable, and most importantly, what's being done to achieve them. Uh, let's go ahead and start with you, Aiden. Yeah, thanks. So, look, the, the kind of targets that are being set, and certainly as a, as a membership, the commitments have, uh, or the, the commitment that members have made is, is to achieve a target of net z zero by 2050 or sooner, and that relates to scope one, two, and three emissions. But that's a long way away, and particularly in the life of an executive of a, of a mining company, you could say it's easy to make that commitment, securing the knowledge that you're not going to be in your job by the time you get to 2050. <laughs> That's why, when it comes to that membership commitment, there is also a commitment to establish short and or medium term targets that lay out a clear pathway for how you're gonna get there. Uh, and so, so I think when it comes to this issue of target setting, we've moved from a position of you know, two, three years ago, we saw a lot of companies making aspirational commitments, which I think landed pretty well, but then in very short order, their investors and their insurers were saying, that's nice, but show me the detail in terms of how you're going to get there. Uh, and so we've been doing a huge amount of work with the membership, particularly around scope, scope three target setting and how you, how you do that in a way that's, that's sensible, that, that recognizes the complexities of that issue. I think on scope one and two, we're probably there already. But, but the extraordinary thing that, that, that from my perspective is, you know, when I was studying environmental sciences in the early to mid 1980s, at that stage, we saw climate change as a clear and present danger. It seems extraordinary to me that it's taken the world a very long time to catch up to what seemed like received wisdom amongst the environment community at that stage. But I'm really encouraged by the pace of progress and the leadership within this sector. Thank you for that, Aiden. Casey, how about you? We uh, have our initial target, which is a net intensity-based target, uh, to reduce net intensity, on, which is emissions on a per ton processed basis, 35% by the end of 2024. This is our, our first goal, it's not gonna be our last goal, uh, but to Aiden's comments, you know, we of course have watched over the last few years as, as uh, many, many companies and, and many companies in our sector have made net zero by 2050 pledges. I would say in addition to not knowing who's gonna be running the company in 2050, uh, we don't know what assets we're gonna have in 2050. There's only, I would say only one of our assets right now might have a fighting chance of still being operating in 2050. So um, we haven't made that commitment yet. We're not shying away from it, but we felt it would be more meaningful to start with a short-term commitment that we could build from the ground up, uh, which is what we did. We, we had a comprehensive exercise with each of our operations to determine what can we do uh, to, to reduce emissions on a net intensity basis. That's the reality of where we are right now as a company, given our position in our growth uh, cycle. Um, and I should say it's been well received. I mean, when we 
when we engage with our largest investors, uh, which we do twice a year, uh, we've gotten strong encouragement from them to have uh, a, a meaningful goal, an ambitious goal, but one that is sort of tied to um, uh, the near term with the expectation that we will roll out you know, successively more ambitious goals. I would also say in another area of positive feedback we've gotten from our largest investors is that we tied a significant portion of the 2022 long-term uh, equity award to achieving that net intensity reduction goal, um, which again has been favorably received. The, the old adage of you know you get what you pay for, and if it's important, it'll show up in the incentive plans. And so um, uh, we're, we're excited to have that that link between compensation and our, our emissions goal. Great. Thanks for that, Casey. It sounds like CORE is really doing some great work there. Okay. You're up, Ryan. So last, uh, the slow sloth of, of insurance ekes it way through. So yeah, same thing. So net zero commitments have been um, made, obviously, in industry. But in, in essence, the, the, the position around insurers making the same commitments has only really just launched. There was a, um, a few that have made those commitments last year and, and in, in essence really has only hit the ground last month with, with a protocol that was launched at Davos by a membership called, very catchy name, the Net Zero Insurance Alliance. Um, and those members have committed to having three things. One, their operations internally. Secondly, their investments. Um, being net zero by 2050, but then the real complication comes that they're expecting that their portfolios from an underwriting perspective will also be net zero on the same basis. So the targets that they're really driving out now is by July of this year, there are three steps that those members will have to commit to. The first bucket uh, is around just straight decarbonizing their portfolio. The second is about engaging with the real economy, so engaging with their ultimate insureds around their plans to encourage and recognize those. And then the third is to ensure the transition. So by July of this year, they have to be committing and opening publicly to what they're going to do in one of those three areas. And then by July of next year, they have to be doing something in each one of those three areas. So the point being is that things are moving forward um, the concepts and, and the data points which aren't in existence at the moment around scope one, two, and three are going to be something that they're going to ask for and encourage. So from our perspective as Marsh, we're trying to make sure that our clients are aware of where these lines may be set and the difference about being able to proactively point to those and where your positions are. From our perspective, we're trying to bring a broader conversation to the, to the front, which is this isn't just about emissions intensity. This is about understanding that the broader economy ha and all industry has a massive part to play in the future of, of the world that we live in. And just having one measurement that, that doesn't understand the other contexts, you know, we could potentially be making unintended consequences and decisions now that we look back on in the future and regret. So we're trying to be the contrarian in the room to bring know, a broader perspective, but also obviously advising customers around where they can prepare themselves to best tackle these issues. Water is a precious resource of ever increasing importance requiring careful management. Starting with Ryan, what are the key elements of water management that insurers are most concerned about with respect to the mines that they're insuring? Yeah, great, thanks. Um, I think this one can get slightly conflated into the hot topic of ESG, but from an insurer's perspective, water you know, is, a, is a key commodity in obviously operating and, and managing you know, mines. And if that isn't at source, if there's a fire, for example, we go back to the oldest type of risk that we, that we all know, there isn't a available and, and consistent source from a water perspective then the damage factor can obviously rise. Insurers are gonna pay more in terms of losses if those items aren't in place. And then clearly there's the next steps around, again, the social interaction and, and, and potential 
um, conflicts with agriculture, etc. That again, underwriters from a risk perspective may be looking towards just to make sure that clients have that consideration or are thinking about those things. Thank you very much for that, Ryan. You said that water is a commodity, and I think that that's something that mining companies are recognizing more and more, that they need to be managing water just like they are the commodities that they're working to obtain. So, Aiden, what are you seeing in this critical space of ICMM member companies? Yeah, I mean, totally kind of uh, endorse that comment you made about you know, the centrality of water in the, the successful operation of mining companies. You know, it's a, it's a critical input and sometimes can be a limiting factor. So I guess as a, as a membership, um, we started to, to think and talk really seriously about the need for a, a more comprehensive approach to the management of water around about 2015 or so. And then in 2016, we brought out a position statement on water stewardship. Uh, and, and in common with all of our other membership commitments, that's endorsed by and signed off by our council of CEOs. Uh, I guess at that stage, it was becoming increasingly important that water represented a, you know, a significant risk for many operations that our members have around the globe. And, and that in part, you know, driven by climate change, those risks were likely to intensify rather than diminish, and that they were, you know, had the potential to result in really significant consequences, both environmentally, socially, but critically financially. So, uh, you know, in parallel with all of that, we had members experiencing a, a massive uptick in interest from, from the investment community, because water, I think, was one of the, the E issues that they tuned into straight after climate, and there's clearly a climate and, and water nexus. And so they were looking for much more comprehensive and granular reporting to say, well, look, what are you doing in terms of, uh, you know, water governance within your company? What are you doing in terms of understanding the totality of your water use and where it comes from? And what are you doing in terms of risk management with respect to water? So all those aspects were reflected in the position statement. Now, the position statement's got a, a focus on several things, but it's got a very strong emphasis on water reporting. And so that's the, the strand that I think is particularly relevant to this conversation, and that's all I'm going to talk about. So on the water reporting side, having made, I think, you know, quite a, a strong, high-level commitment to, to much more uh, robust reporting in terms of use, risk management, governance, we then had to go away and figure out, well, well what does that reporting look like? So we engage deeply with external stakeholders, we engage deeply with our members to come up with a practical guide to consistent water reporting back in 2017. And that really laid out the minimum reporting disclosures that members needed to go into. Now, as we all know, the world tends not to stand still. And so in rapid short order, we had the GRI, come, the Global Reporting Initiative, come out with its water reporting standard. We had the Carbon Disclosure Project come up with a, a water security questionnaire for high-risk sectors, including the mining and metal sector. Uh, and meanwhile, our companies that were busily getting on with implementation were finding there are some issues here with the, consistent, with the consistent interpretation of some of the water reporting requirements. And, and that's, you know, that is the enemy to consistent reporting. So taking all of that, we went back with the members in 2020. We updated the guidance. Uh, and it's now, I think, you know, extremely strong, really fit for purpose. It allows them to give a full account of their water use, their water governance, risk management. But also, it's, it's, you know, essentially, this is a resource that's available to the wider industry in common with all ICMM's guidance documents. It's not just for members. It's there to be taken uh, and used by any interested company. Great. Thank you for that. Reminds me of my consulting days. Every mine has a water problem. Too much or too little, right? <laughs> so... Uh, moving on to biodiversity and natural capital. These are quickly emerging as key areas of focus for investors, insurance carriers, and other stakeholders. The increased focus is illustrated by the UN Biodiversity Conference held in Montreal this past December, and the introduction of the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, also known as the TNFD, to address the biodiversity and natural capital in the same way that the TCFD provides a framework for climate-related financial disclosures and risk management. So let's start with you, Casey. Can you respond um, how CORE is responding to this and where you see it going? Sure. This has sort of come 
to the forefront in the last year or two. It's one of the top issues that we hear about from stakeholders during our engagement. Um, and so, you know, what we're doing about it is we're, we're developing a biodiversity standard this year. I know companies like Newmont um, have, have already come out with a standard. Um, but it's a, it, 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 the, the COP15 conference, the TNFD uh, disclosure framework, and the, the overlap between uh, natural capital and biodiversity and, and climate, um, we're hearing uh, from, from stakeholders that we need to address you know, this set of issues holistically. What does that mean for us already? Uh, it means that we take uh, biodiversity and minimizing impacts into account in mine design um, through our concurrent reclamation uh, processes and also from a wildlife protection perspective. I'd also say that there's a, a community aspect to this as well. Um, there's a, a strong sort of social risk management prong in the sense that, uh, you know, for example, at our Rochester mine in Nevada, we were the first mining company to buy sage grouse conservation credits um, under the state of Nevada's program, which was a positive from a community relations perspective as well because we bought those credits from a local ranch. So um, it's, it's uh, creating more economic benefit in the community uh, at, at the same time that we're protecting biodiversity. Great, thank you for that. Ryan, how about the carriers? Have they caught up yet? <laughs> Do you want to guess? <laughs> Uh, they are. No, no truthfully, that, that's flippant of me to say that. that some of them are, uh, and some of them see, again, those that have studied and understand sustainability and the balance between people, planet, prosperity, and the principles of governments, understand that, you know, if we're trying to do all these things to protect the planet from, from a heating environment, then actually if we haven't got a biosphere and we haven't got biodiversity, Ultimately, you know, we're not going to have enough food to supply, you know, to, to feed ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. So I do think they're, they're aware of it. From, from a marsh perspective, um, we have a team seconded to the TNFD to be at the front of the, the, the building, the framework. So that from that perspective, as it does, and it's an extremely complicated. If we thought ESG was complicated, nature is 10 to the X times more complicated to understand. Nobody can tell you where it starts and finishes for that, but how far do we scope in various different dynamics? But we're at the forefront of thinking about it because we do consider that once the net zero commitments have been bled into underwriting in a, in a, former, in a formal manner, and sustainability and ESG comes, then nature at, probably at the same time is gonna be another one of those considerations. So, we're thinking about the horizon, but clearly cle dealing with clients' issues today, but for, for warning them that this is something that we should, and, and good to see that, that it is being considered within the mining space, especially. Great, thank you. And Naden, how about ICMM? Where do you all see it going? Yeah, yeah so I mean, biodiversity is one of those issues where we've been on quite a long journey within ICMM, um, and so, Going right back to two, you know, 20 years ago, 2003, we, we brought out a mining and protected areas position statement. And at that stage, um, the, we were thinking, what is the, the most important areas in need of protection? And so the commitment was that member companies would neither explore nor mine in World Heritage properties. Uh, and if they were operating mines adjacent to World Heritage properties, that they would make sure that their activities were not incompatible for the outstanding universal value for which those properties have been designated. Then fast forward 10 years, we, we, we extended the commitment to uh, protected areas more broadly. And at that stage, what, what the agreement was that, you know, if you are uh, either uh, mining in or near to a protected areas, that for any new projects or expansions to existing projects, you have to make sure that your activities are not incompatible with uh, the biodiversity for which those uh, areas have been designated. And then more recently in, in 2020, when we, when we brought out the, the comprehensive mining principles, at that stage we raised the bar further still to say that through the application of the mitigation hierarchy, members would pursue an ambition of achieving no net loss. But, it, but it's fair to say that beyond the, kind of the, the policy commitments, 
uh, as, as an organization, we had deprioritized biodiversity. Um, and I'm pleased to say that that is very much right back as a central priority for the organization. And that's just taking into, to, to, into account the, the extraordinary declines we see in biodiversity around the globe. And in some ways, you know, the tragedy of biodiversity loss is that while there is some prospect for reversing uh, or mitigating climate change effects uh, in the longer run, you know, once something's lost, it's lost you know, in perpetuity. Uh, and so we have reprioritized biodiversity in terms of the current strategy cycle, which started last year, runs 2022 to 2024. And as part of that, we're looking again to see is our membership commitment fit for purpose, or is there more we may need to do, particularly when it comes to embracing a nature positive agenda, which seems to be the direction of travel that we're going in. And then lastly, and specifically on uh, the task force for nature related financial disclosures, we're working really closely with them to both develop and pilot test an approach that works for the mining sector. Uh, and as, as Ryan said, this is an extraordinarily fast moving agenda and it's one that, that you know you blink, you miss it, but it's really important to be a part of it. Thank you all for that. So now we're gonna move into a really important topic of tailings management and those in the audience that know who I am are probably wondering how could we get through an ESG session this long without Kim bringing up tailings. So in the tailing space, we see the investment community as a key driver for change with the principles for responsible investment as a co-convener of the Global Industry Standard on Tailings Management, or GISTM, as well as the Global Tailings Management Institute. Aiden, starting with you, how has the investment community as well as the technical community worked well together or perhaps not? Is it logical for investors to drive ESG initiatives that can result in technical challenges and changes? Yeah, th thanks, Kim. I, I guess uh, I would probably point to the example of the work that led to the development of the Global Industry Standard on Tailings Management as a really great example of the investment community and the technical community coming together to develop something of enduring value. Um, and as you said, that, that process was co-convened by the Principles for Responsible Investment, by ICMM, and by UNEP, the, the United Nations Environment Program. And I think part of the power of that process is that it was kind of multi-stakeholder from, from the get-go. Um, and uh, yeah, multi-stakeholder beyond the three co-convening partners because we had a, a uh, a large multi-stakeholder advisory group that input it to the process. And we also had uh, you know, a global consultation on a draft that, that, you know, in seven languages in multiple jurisdictions. So truly multi-stakeholder process and truly multi-stakeholder outcome. Uh, I guess the other thing about that, that process is that it wasn't just the mining industry or indeed the investment community that were, were driving that. And I think part of the su success of the effort was, it was well financed, so that the mining industry through the ICMM members provided adequate resources for a really strong process. And that allowed us, I think, to hire a, a really good independent chair who had the good sense to surround himself with deep expertise on the, the kind of skills that you needed to bring to bear to put together the multidisciplinary standard that we have. So, you know, for me, it's a, it's a great example of uh, you know, how things can work and how things can result uh, in a really good outcome. And I would argue that the standard, uh, you know, it is exacting, it's tough to implement, but it does provide really strong protections for, for people, uh, for the environment, and, and it's got zero tolerance for human fatality, and that I think is exactly what we should be aspiring to. Um, my response to that larger question of is it logical for investors to kind of drive initiatives that can result in, in uh, you know, technical changes. I've got, a, I've got a slightly more qualified response there. And so I think it's entirely legitimate and indeed it's logical that investors can be part of catalyzing those kinds of initiatives. I think it's entirely legitimate that they be active participants in those kinds of initiatives and that they were with the Global Tailings Review. But whether the investment community has the legitimacy to either uh, to either lead 
uh, or to effectively manage those kind of processes. I think the jury is still out on that question. Thank you very much for that, Aidan. So Casey, have you at CORE felt pressure from investors to make changes to your ESG programs in general? We certainly have seen the influence that the investment community has had in the tailing space. In what ways and what has CORE implemented in response? Yeah, it's, well, it's certainly uh, an engaged dialogue. Uh, we conduct outreach twice a year. We reach out to everybody who holds more than 0.15% of our shares, so it's a, a low bar, so we can uh, get input not just from the top five largest holders, but down the register a bit. Um, as far as pressure, I mean, I, I, I feel like we're, we're keeping pace. In some ways, we, we set the pace and we surprise them. In other ways, they, uh, you know, will hear some suggestions which, um, uh, which we take back and, and consider whether to implement. Tailings uh, management certainly um, is a, a key focus. Like a lot of companies, we received the letter from the Church of England um, uh, pension fund and, and, uh, and, and provided disclosures and made certain commitments in response to that. Uh, we're also on our GISTM uh, alignment journey um, uh, because we, we think it's a responsible thing to do. And clearly, it's a, it's a framework that's emerging as uh, a, a bit of a must-have in terms of, of uh, uh, being a responsible producer. In other areas, uh, I think your question is a little bit broader than just tailings. Um, in, in other areas, we, we receive a lot of encouragement. On the climate side, we talked about targets uh, a moment ago, but a big part of it is the scenario analysis, w which is really all about identifying and mitigating risk. And we've received a lot of encouragement um, from our largest uh, investors and other stakeholders to do not just company level scenario analysis, but last year we did a scenario analysis at each site, which um, identified uh, some really actionable um, uh, mitigation steps that we can take uh, around a, a range of issues from emissions to, to water. And then I would, I would put in a plug um, for governance as well. It's kind of the unsung hero of, of ESG. Aidan mentioned this a few minutes ago. Uh, a lot of the, the uh, heat and light can be on environmental and social um, issues, uh, but we consistently hear a focus on, on governance and encouragement to, to maintain our strong governance profile. There was an ISS survey of ESG-focused asset managers not too long ago that had a whole range of, of ESG factors. I think there were a dozen or more factors that they could, you know, sort of stack rank by importance. And, and governance came out number one of all of them. So um, that's, that's an area, again, it's not really pressure, but ongoing dialogue and, and a clear expectation that we maintain a strong governance profile. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so we know that the GISTM has a clause about um, needing operators to obtain insurance to the extent practicable. ICMM members have also committed to the GISTM and hence having their tailings facilities insured. Large companies can potentially self-insure, while most small companies typically can't, with a major failure event having the potential to put them out of business without that insurance coverage. As we know, no matter whose facility it is, every tailings failure does impact the wider industry and our reputation as a whole. We've also heard there's some rumors that some junior mining companies are making the decision not to insure tailings due to the high premiums or inability to meet documentation requirements that the insurance marketplace has become more sophisticated and is now requesting. So Aiden, does this mindset of not pursuing coverage cause further damage to the mining industry reputation at large? So I guess the, the short answer is probably yes, but, but the slightly longer answer, and again, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, you know, we've got two insurance experts on, you know, on, here on the stage. I'd be really interested in your view and Ryan's view. Um, but just one of the things I've been struck by is, you know, kind of a, almost a, a shift in perspective within the insurance industry. And I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm taking a long-term view here over about 20 years or so. So 20 years ago, I, I worked for the two private sector arms of the World Bank. And, you know, on the one hand, you have the International Finance Corporation, the IFC, 
Uh, and the IRC, you know, simplistically, provides loans to, to companies. Uh, and on the other hand, you've got the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, and that provides insurance to companies. And so on the investment side, the IFC used to conduct really deep due diligence into prospective clients. And you know, they did that on the basis that, you know, simplistically, once the money's dispersed, you know, it's gone. Now, that's a little bit simplistic, but what that meant is they did this deep, deep due diligence. You know, and in contrast, MIGA had really light touch due diligence at that stage. And, and that's because you know, the insurance industry relies on a, on a principle of utmost good faith. And simply say that that means you know, if you as a client lie to your insurer, or, or maybe if you just haven't disclosed material information, when it comes around to a, a claim situation, the insurer is just gonna turn around and say, we're denying the claim. It's no different to, to, to Kelly, you or I, we're going after our car insurance, which gets increasingly uh, pricey. And we're just a little bit economical with our driving record or with the points in our license with the insurer. You know, come the time when I have a prang, it's gonna be me that's paying the bill, not my insurer. So, you know, again, I think that principle has served the insurance industry well, but what struck me is the sea change in terms of the level of due diligence that, that MEGA, for example, undertakes. And I'm a little bit familiar with, with MEGA relative to what it did 20 years ago. And when it comes to mining companies and specifically tailings facilities, that's something that they are really looking hard at. But, but as I say, you know, the short answer is, is yes. Where companies have inadequate financial capacity to cover the estimated costs of you know, plan closure, early closure, reclamation or post-closure, and that's what the clause in the, in the gist really focuses on, that's really problematic. Now, what do you do about it? One of the things you do is that I think as the standard becomes increasingly normative with investors, whether individual companies choose to insure or not becomes moot because if investors are requiring them to do it, they're gonna to struggle to attract investment if they don't have uh, those right provisions in place. Ryan, how about your thoughts? So um, I think relativity is always a, a great leveler in, in these situations. And, and tailings dams is, and, and coverage is, is clearly something that costs a considerable amount and, and is, a, is a purchase that, that has to be considered at the highest level. But I would say that th this is a similar challenge in a number of other industries. We've got a sad um, derailment event, obviously, in the US with a, chem with a chemical leakage. That is a similar challenge in that space around trying to buy general liability coverages on an excess basis for, for that exposure. A and the challenge does come down to um, profitability, ultimately, from, from the insurance. But, uh, but I think if we take a step back, you know, in the insurance gap is, is clearly one that insurance brokers and underwriters are continually picking at and try to fix. You know, the, the challenge part is that those that need the insurance the most are generally the ones that are sadly excluded. And that applies globally and it applies in this instance too. But, but I think if we take a small step back, and I think we've tried to thread this through in some of the conversation, process and, and guidelines and standards are excellent. And, and they set a standard and they create some comfort between the risk bearer and the risk taker around what is expected but the reality is if we can really push sustainability and ESG to the next level, it's, it's understanding culture. A and culture is the default that fixes all of the other problems. I know we've had a couple of quotes, but one of those favorites that, that culture eats, it eats strategy for breakfast it, it is the reality in some of these instances. And I think if we can build out some of those data points and get underwriters to feel comfortable around the culture and the process, and the ability to ensure, then actually it isn't just the larger companies who can, again, deal with the, re the reporting and the premiums that, that go with it, but actually we can get insurance to step in and do as it should do, bear some of that risk for those customers. So I'll, I'll leave with a more positive outlook that hopefully that's somewhere where we're moving towards as we evolve the thinking rather than just price and coverage. Great, thank you for that. So this is just another question for Ryan. From my perspective as the, tech, the technical lead for tailings at a major mining company, I'm finding that insurers are becoming more 
and more sophisticated with respect to review and understanding of tailings risks that insurers are plucking away and employing tailings experts like Kelly here. And the questions that I need to field from our insurers are getting increasingly more challenging. Why is that? Is it becoming more difficult for companies with less robust ESG practices in regards to tailings to maintain insurance? And what about beyond tailings? I'm surprised you didn't start with a Mr. Bond question. <laughs> it felt, felt a little, there was a finger just about to be pointed at me because I was to blame. But uh, let me take a, a small step back. So as a broker, my responsibility is to my client ultimately. Um, and I certainly don't empathize or sympathize with insurers. That's not my job, that's not my responsibility. But I think part of what makes a good broker is somebody who can understand the pressures, understand the questions, and understand the reasons why some of these things are being asked. So that I can be one step ahead, think about protecting and putting my customers in, in the best positions that they can be. And I think the answer to your question probably started a few years ago, in essence. And, and this becomes an economics and a finance issue as much as it does become a tailings issue. And an underwriter it essentially is going to write a multitude of different risks. And in essence is looking for, in a situation where they don't know how to uh, interpret, they're looking for expert advice. And most human beings are doing that for two reasons. One, they admit that they haven't got that expertise, or they're generally bringing somebody else in to share the blame if it goes wrong. So, I'm gonna talk poorly of my brethren in the insurance industry, and I would suggest that the latter is a, is a large part of what's happening here. So, in, in order to continue to write in a volatile space, you bring in experts and you share that burden. Because when, and certainly in a tailings dam environment, these aren't generally gonna be insignificant losses. And it's the most annoying thing from an underwriter's perspective is not a loss, because they want to pay. That's why the whole system works. But the piece that gets them scared is unexpected and outsized. And that's the challenge around tailings dams that again, bringing in experts helps them maintain positions on the account more broadly and offering some support. So I don't think that's a specific answer, but I think it, it gives you some context to profitability and again, sharing that, that burden of, of proof around that the right questions have been asked and that right risk selection has been taken forward. Thank you very much for that, Ryan. So if I'm listening to your response correctly, it really is that tailing space where you've honed in and you've brought in more of that expertise to support you from the insurer side not so much other general ESG elements. Uh, correct. I think when you're thinking about why somebody is bringing somebody in, think about severity and the outsized nature of what that could possibly be. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So at this time, we will be collecting those questions from the audience. Um, but while those collections are occurring, um, we are going to switch gears a little bit um, and talk about the future and innovation with especially automation um, and how that can drastically change the workforce of the future. So Casey, how is CORE looking to shape conversations around human capital and automation in regards to community relations and DEI opportunities? Sure, it's, it's a timely uh, question and it's going to become a more important topic in the years to come. Automation and innovation are disrupting our industry um, Disruption is a neutral term. It can be positive and negative. We see more opportunity uh, than risk um, in, in the disruption. Uh, just as, as one example, if we're operating a remote uh, site that, that controls autonomous trucks, we can hire into that site you know, people from, uh, from all backgrounds, all physical abilities, um, uh, it, it opens up our talent pool um, when we consider, you know, the, the kinds of capabilities that are required to operate automated equipment as opposed to traditional equipment. Just and anecdotally, the, one of the jobs that, that we're finding the hardest to fill uh, these days with the highest turnover is haul truck drivers. And so, um, 
you know, the, the trend toward, toward automation, uh, we think will, will reduce uh, the risk in that area. As far as community uh, risk goes, I mean, there, there, we, we all need to be concerned and, and make sure that we take into account the impacts on local communities um, from particular jobs that may not be offered locally anymore. Uh, but in general, I would say that all of our sites, we're, we're in constant hiring mode. We, we always need more people than we can find. We struggle to meet our local hire targets. And so um, from a, a community perspective, I think it's important to, to communicate um, a, you know, our, our transition plans as we increase automation and innovation, but also to communicate how many new job opportunities for a wider range of, of people uh, that opens up. Great, thank you so much for that. Thank you. So do we have a couple of questions from the audience? All right. So thank you all for the questions. It looks like they have quite a pile to sort through. So the first question, what opportunities do you see for greater collaboration on water supply or beneficial use between competing users. This includes competing mining companies, the agricultural sector, and communities. Who should convene such collaborations? Anyone that would like to respond to that? I, I can address, uh, you know, we've, we have two water scarce sites, um, our, our Rochester mine in Nevada and Palmerejo in Mexico. One way that we have, I think, collaborated well is that in securing water rights that we need for the future, not for today, um, we have done a couple of, of sale and leaseback transactions with, with some local ranchers where, you know, the willing seller, uh, they're, they're looking to, um, to, to, to monetize their, their ranch for a variety of reasons, financial planning, state planning, whatever it is. We stand ready as, as the buyer, uh, they stay on their ranch, they lease it from us, and they continue to put the water to beneficial use, which, as everybody knows, it's a key concern. I mean, step one is acquiring the rights, and step two is making sure that they're put to beneficial use. So I think that's an example of collaboration um, that uh, a lot of companies in our space are, are using, um, and that can be mutually beneficial from a community perspective. Thank you very much for that, Casey. Would anybody else like to comment on that question? Yeah, just br briefly. One is to kind of say that, that again, that, that notion of water as a shared resource, it extends to, to both human users and non-human users in terms of biodiversity. And so I think when it comes to conversations around the collaborative management of water, those need to be inclusive conversations. And typically, the, the sensible kind of unit at which those conversations can, can take place is either at the catchment or the watershed level. But just in terms of a, a specific example, I think that brings to life the notion of, of shared use of water or almost sequential use of water. I think the, the, the work that Freeport have done at the Cerro Verde mine near Arequipa in southern Peru is really interesting because there they were looking at expanding the, the mining asset uh, against a backdrop of operating in a really arid environment. They were close to a, a community, the city of Arequipa, that's home to about a million or so people. And that population was uh, critically underserved in terms of water and sanitation infrastructure. Um, and so, you know, the creative solution, I think, that, that uh, Cerro Verde came up with to try and deal with their water supply challenge was to say, let's not think of water as a single-use asset. Let's think instead of water as a sequential-use asset. And so they invested very significantly with the municipality in putting in place uh, water and sanitation infrastructure. Uh, and that included... Uh, both this on the supply side, but then on the treatment side. So you have this great big water treatment plant, which ultimately treats high volumes of water uh, that then are uh, fit to be discharged back into the local river. So th th I guess the trick that, that Freeport pulled off at Cerro Verde was to say, we're going to support you in terms of putting in the infrastructure. 
on the basis that we get you know, a, a shot at using that water that, that comes through the wastewater treatment plant, we'll then retreat it before it goes back into the river and is available to downstream water users. So I think it's a brilliant illustration of you know, almost people first, enterprise second, and then you know, agri-enterprises and local farmers you know, uh, sequentially. So I think the more you can bring that kind of mindset to, to bear, then, then the better outcomes we'll see in terms of shared water use. Great, thank you for that. Okay, so Aiden, I think it was you that framed the conflict between ESG and anti-ESG state attorneys generals as a debate. So for any of the pa panelists, how do you see this debate being resolved? Uh, from the insurance perspective, if I take that, I, I think the reality being that there is going to be an an appreciation that nobody knows the answer and, and the, the ability to, to suggest that we're actually moving forward with, with this and having a clear perspective around what's being asked, why it's being asked and when it's going to be taken into account from an insurance perspective will help engagement. The reality is there's a lot of black box underwriting and a lot of um, which nobody likes. What we want to understand is what the actual sum is and what the outcome is and when it's going to be applied. So I think that debate helps validate or, quite frankly, pushes out a lot of the, uh, the broader non-specific questions that are being asked and then we can get down to something that's got clear clarity around how it's going to affect the outcome from an insurance or an investment or a stakeholder perspective. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I would say that, that how this um, political debate is resolved is interesting to watch and it's something we need to be mindful of. Um, we're not really hanging on how that debate is resolved in terms of what our priorities are um, and, and what we focus on in, in our engagement with, with our stakeholders. It's, Clearly, it's, it's, it's a thing, it's, it's impacting all of us, but um, the, the clear message that we're getting from not only our investors, but all of our stakeholders is uh, that this is a, a, a political sideshow and it's not, uh, it doesn't detract from what they want us to focus on or what we yeah. view as our, our own material items. Uh, and I won't, I won't quote the exact data points, but Mercer, who's a sister company to us that does benefits and, and health um, support, has got evidence around the, the link to executive pay, and those numbers are, are, are moving forward at pace. So that the political backdrop, as Casey's point, isn't actually slowing the actual agenda within organizations, but we'll see what happens in the end. So maybe just a small thing to add, and that is, as you go through life, you pick up certain rules, and one of them is never work with children and, and animals, never follow Eeyore when it comes to making your opening remarks to a conference like this, <laughs> and, and never wade into U.S. politics as a non-U.S. citizen. <laughs> but I think maybe the thing I could say without, without perhaps... Break the rule. Break the breaking rule. the rule <laughs> is that political cycles are extraordinarily s short in the grand scheme. You know, it's interesting, of the 19 state attorneys generals that wrote that letter, one of them's withdrawn on the basis there's been a political change in, in, in one of the states. And what, what we have seen in terms of the ESG agenda is, irrespective of what is going on politically in any jurisdiction, companies are having to take a long-term view. Uh, and so in the same way that through, I think, with the, you know, the, the previous political administration uh, in, in, uh, at a presidential level in the U.S., uh, an awful lot of companies, irrespective of the sentiment that was coming out of Washington, were saying, we've got to take a long-term view, we've got to do this, we've got to get on with it and not get distracted by what's going on politically. Yeah. There was a fantastic article, um, and the title was that ESG was going to have a bouncy and troubled year, but actually sustainability was moving forward, and I think that probably sums it up. Great, thank you very much for that. How is life cycle analysis of mining operations being used to assess ESG issues and help identify steps that can be taken to achieve decarbonization and sustainability 
and minimize negative environmental and social impacts. Wow. Did you need me the to read that question. one again? Casey, Ryan? do you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> well, if I, under, if I understand it correctly, I, I think, you know, life of mine is a critical factor. And uh, to use an example, our Kensington gold mine in Alaska um, has a, you know, four and a half, five year mine life based on reserves right now. It runs on diesel generators. We would love to have a clean energy solution for that mine, and we're actually actively engaged on the government relations side uh, to try to secure um, either federal or state, you know, funding to help run an, uh, a power line out to the operation. But, but when you're talking about a mine life as short as that, I mean, of course, we hope and we have a long track record of, of you know, replacing depletion and and. We've operated on a three to five year mine life for 15, 13, 15 years now. So I believe that it will still be operating uh, well into the future, but it certainly constrains uh, capital allocation decisions when, when you only have a short life ahead of you. Yeah, and, and to be serious for four and second, I, I think that the challenge part is the annual venture from an insurance standpoint, the way that capital is bought, that reinsurance is purchased. So again, we're bringing together all of those concepts. We're trying to push the reinsurance community to look longer term around how they would support various carriers and in that essence then could think about providing products um, on the ground that would, would have longer tenure in their view and therefore would take considerations rather than just a point in time intensity into consideration as they support culture, overarching goals, what they're being delivered, where the, where the minerals are actually going to be used in the, the positive environment in, in the long run is something to be thought about. But that's a, a complicated um, endeavor to achieve. Excellent. Well, at this time, I think that that's all the time that we have for today. So this has been a truly engaging and informative session. On behalf of SME, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists for sharing their time and insight. So please join Kelly and me in a round of applause for our panelists.